All right. Good evening, guys. Hope you had a great day. And I know we are running a little late, an unexpected date tonight. So we're continuing reading Wonka, and tonight is chapters 13 to 17. The shop. The next new morning, new little dredger cart out of scrubbing and bleachers and headed for town. To anyone who passed her, it must have looked like she was speaking to the laundry. He came back, she said, sound unconvinced. The laundry bag really was hiding as wiggled. Yes, Noodle. A little green man came Abbott's confused voice from his laundry bag. Green hair, Piper corrected him from her laundry bag. Orange man. Yes, Willie said. I set a trap and he walked right into it. Noodle sapped the cart. So where is he then? There was a long pause and then Willie said, Oh, well, we had a fight. See, he wanted, he hit me with a frying pan and then stomped on my fingers before taking the chocolate and jumping out of the window. Of course, Mule said flatly. Then, then she tapped the cart to let them know the coast was clear. You don't believe me, do you? Willie said as he climbed out. Honestly, Noodle said, no, not one bit. Do any of you believe me? Willie asked. The others all stared at him with a look of intense fascination. Like small children watching a monkey misbehaving at the zoo. No, Abacus admitted. No, Piper said. Lottie shook her head. Um, no. No, Larry said. Noodle smiled a mischievous smile. But as it ha so happens, we don't need to sell chocolate today. We don't? Why, Willie said. You know that shop girl said the way you could agree with her? Willie's heart stood still. Well, Noodle said, and she held up a set of keys. They went immediately, they went immediately to see the place hurrying through the galleries going made. When they got there, Willie stared in at the keys, blinking in his hands. He could hardly breathe. These are more than keys to a shop, he said. In shock at what his friends had done for him, they're the keys to my dream. Legally speaking, it's just a shop. But yes, emotionally, it is also your dream, Abacus said with a matter of fat tongue. I'll let him have this one, Piper said, and Willie was sure he even spied a tear in her eye. I can't believe such kindness exists, Willie said, his voice cracking as he said the chocolatier who can make people fly can't believe in this kind of kindness. You the laugh, surely not. Willie smiled at each and every one of them. I haven't felt this feeling since I was a young boy at home. He said, and placed the key carefully in the lock and turned it. The door creaked, and together they all stepped inside. Willie stood with his hands on his hips, surveying the place. It needed sprucing up, there was for, that was for sure. The wall here was peeling off the walls, and most of the ceiling was on the floor, along with a smashed chandelier. It does need work, Abigail said. Looks like somebody left the wire on twenty years ago and the ceiling fell to Piper Muse. And the ceiling above that and the ceiling above that. But that means we can afford it for a week anyway, Abbas just clarified. Willie felt anxious, felt Noodle's anxious eyes on him. What do you think? she whispered. Will it work? It's a horrible mess, Willie said. I've never seen a shop in such a dreadful state. It's absolutely horrendously perfect. I mean, sure, it's a wreck, but look at the potential of the bones. This is going to be the best chocolate shop in the world. We won't need more than a week, Abba, because we get this right, we'll sell so much chocolate, we'll be free by Friday. The very thought made Noodle's eyes well with tears, and she flung her arms around Willie and squeezed him tightly. All right, Abba said, but we're not out of the woods yet. We best get back to the wash house before roll call. Chapter 14, That Girl. The workers emerged from the storm drain by the wash house. But this time they were not alone. In a neighboring window stood three sinister figures, and next to them stood Chocolate Snapple and Chief Chief of the Loop. There's six of them in total, he said that his mouth bulging with chocolate, including the little girl. She seems to be the brains of the operation. The others do what she says. Look. They all watched in silence as Noodle ordered the workers into the laundry sack and then heaved the cart through the door. And then there is the laundry. Scrubbing and bleachers, it's called, the chief said, shoving another fistful of chocolate into his mouth. Slugworth looked up sharply at the name and Scrubbers, he said. Miss Muppets, the chief managed between the big chews. He gulped a mouthful of chocolate down. Why? You know it? Slugworth stared down ahead. Yes, he said. As a matter of fact, I do. The chief shook the empty box of chocolate in a mild panic flashed across his eyes. Oh no, gone again. He fidgeted, fighting the urge, but it, but it was no good. 
you know, he pointed out, I'm happy to do whatever you want to get rid of them all. I mean, anything. They just ran a shop so legally I can't touch them. But illegally, I'm happy to do whatever you guys want. You want them all to have a little accident? Man, which they die, Prime those out. No problem, the chief said, but it's going to cost you a lot more chocolate. All right, chief, Slugwood said, waving a dismissive hand. You can have more. And I'd be grateful if I could have an advance. Because those other boxes you gave me, they're all gone, he said. Everything's gone. What? Fickle Gruber cried. All of them, Chief? Yep, I've run out. I've been eating these little paper cases for the past three days, and they're not even chocolate. He held up some wrappers and then shoved them in his mouth. You gotta help me, Mr. Slugger, please. I got a tape for the brown stuff. I got it real bad. Slugger scrunched up his face trying to swallow his disgust. He handed the Chief another box. Here you go, Chief. And there's plenty more where that came from. But stand down for now. I'll give you a call when the time's right. Thank you, Mr. Slugworth, the chief said. Thank you. Thank you. Slugworth looked at his binoculars and watched the little girls have five suspiciously human-shaped laundry bags down the chute. What is it, Arthur? Fickle Gruber asked. The girl, Slugworth said quietly. What girl? Prognos asked, grabbing the binoculars. Oh, that girl. You don't really think it could be her, do you? Fickle Gruber said. I do, Slugworth replied. Fickle Gruber became fidgety. You always assured us she wouldn't be a problem, Prognos nodded. He's right, you did assure it. She won't be Slugworth said coldly. In normal Wonka, I'll see to it personally. Chapter 15 Dog Mrs. Scrubber wasn't used to visitors at night. It was nearly midnight when a shadowy figure knocked on her door. She drew back the hatch, eyes rolling around furiously as they saw the person who had dared disturb her at such an hour. Who is it? she growled. What do you want? Slugworth stepped forward into the light of the hatch, his face menacing cut through the shadow. Mrs. Scrubber, he said, and there was a deathly silence. Then suddenly, the door flung open. Mr. Slugworth, Scrubber, Mrs. Scrubber Bellow, falling over herself to let the man in. Bleacher appeared behind her, a huge hulk and present emerging from the gloom. But as he got closer, Slugworth could see what they were wearing. Silky sweet matching his and her sets of pajamas covered in knitted pictures of tittles. Who is it, my honey? Wow, Bleacher cried. It's the chocolatier himself. To what do we owe the honor, sir? Mrs. Scrubber said with gravelly courtesy. I wonder, Mr. Slugworth, his lips curling into a mean smile. Then might I take a look in your wash house? What? Down in the sun? Strange request, especially at this time of night. But follow me. Bleacher grunted, leading the way down the stairs. Mrs. Scrubber hurried along behind him. We're in Ion, she informed Slugworth proudly. Bavarian royalty we are. But Slugworth was barely listening. His fists were clenched. His pace was quick. He was clearly not in the mood for chit-chat. I don't know what you're expected to find down there, Mrs. Scrubber Bramble, her voice getting nervous. It's just a perfectly normal watch house served by a perfectly normal... She came to an abrupt halt, and her mouth fell open with what she saw. Dog, she finished. She and Bleacher soon sunk silence at the fully mechanized laundry pad, entirely by Tittles weird and bent, the pots in front of him. Tittles, Bleacher said, shaking his head in dismay. How could you? But that wasn't all. There was a mountain of strange jars filled with ingredients that sparkled and bubbled and buzzed. There was everything from thick blobs of gunk to translucent liquids. Some were fizzing and cracking wildly, while others were being neatly dispensed with cooking pans, one drip at a time. Not a single one of the ingredients was identifiable. What in the name of warm water is this, Mrs. Scrubber quote? You have a guess. A Mr. Wonka, Slugworth said. He's been sneaking out to sell chocolate with the help of your servant girl. That little brat, the Scrubber spat furiously. Slugworth turned to Mrs. Scrubber, a mean glint in his eye. How would you like to help me put them out of business? He said. Mrs. Scrubber eyed the potions and licked her lips greedily. For the washout workers, they had been nonstop building and paying and melting chocolate in secret. They had never been happier. And the best thing about it was Slugworth, Bill, Roo, and Prados were completely unaware of what was going on in the gallery's gourmet right under their noses. Despite all the strange noises coming from behind the yellow and paper that lined the empty shop, no one came to ask any questions. Soon the shop was ready and the grand opening was upon it. Willie was a bonbon of nerves, a cream puff of fear, a big wall of jelly-like excitement. He had scrubbed his purple coat for the occasion and it came out gleaming like new. When the doors to the gallery's gourmet opened, he really Ladies and gentlemen, she called striking his candy girl. Greetings to you all, and welcome to Wonka's. Tremendous things are in store for you. An old man shuffling past stopped and stared up at him. What? In there? 
Willie Turner beamed him at his chef. Monica was painted with the door in glistening gold and the same style his mother had drawn his birthday chocolate bar all those years ago. Inside the place, it was mysteriously dark. The old chandelier was still lying, lifeless on the floor. Humor me, Willie said, holding out a hand for the old man. Close your eyes and count to ten. The old man reluctantly shut his eyes. One, he drawn, and Willie led him to the darkest side of the seat. It's a count of nine. Then very carefully, Willie lit a match and placed it in the chandelier. Make a wish, Willie said. Now open it. As the man did so, Larry yanked a rope and the chandelier shot upward. It swayed up high, illuminating all that was inside. The man practically collapsed in shock when he saw the place. He grabbed Willie's arm to steady himself. Here's a story like no other. If it were, I wouldn't bother. Willie chimed. And all around him was a whole landscape entirely whole landscape built entirely of chocolate and sweets, a lush green meadow of chocolate grass with peppered with chocolate. Flowers and toadstools made of icing in the center of the meadow said a delicious looking willow tree, its trunk carved from solid dark chocolate, in branches hung low and dipped down into a chocolate river that flowed through the store. Chocolate trees, chocolate flowers, Willie said quietly, more than himself from the old man. Memories made in chocolate that I won't let melt away again. The old man suddenly gasped because down the chocolate river came a chocolate barge boat completely with a peppermint line and filled with head-sized jelly beans. Willie turned back to the door and saw someone walking toward him. The lights inside were blinded and making her no more than a silhouette, but she looked just like her. Hope bubbled up in his stomach. It was her. His mother was there, just like he said. But when she grew closer, he could see it was only a stranger with a young child skipping behind her. Welcome, Willie said with a sad smile as he snapped back to reality. He pitched a chocolate flower and gave it to the child. It's all edible. Soon, more and more customers would flock into the shop as word spread that Willie was back. Before long, the place was packed to burst with people screeching and shrieking and gasping at the edible world. Willie skipped around the shop at speed, seizing customers' hands and shaking them vigorously. Welcome, welcome, he cried with excitement. He plucked flowers for them and scooped up cupfuls of melted chocolate from the river. Here, try the river. It's delicious. At one point, he dived into a hole into the tree truck and merged at the top so he began climbing to the uppermost branches. The crowd applied as he got all the way to the ceiling where clumps of cotton candy clouds floated. Then Willie raised his can and pressed a button on the whole thing unfurled like an umbrella. Just in time, too, sweets started to fall like rains from above. The crowd went wild. Then came the fireworks, but not any old ordinary fireworks. Willie's fireworks blasted across the sky, leaving edible strings in their wake. The customers grabbed for them, licking them and chewing them, their mouths so full their cheeks were ten times their normal size. Willie watched the scene and felt a tingling sense of pride course through him. A bubblegum bloom floated past and he grabbed hold of it and soared through the air as the customers looked up at him and awe. Over at the till, Noodle was packing up great armfuls of chocolate. The old man was right at the front of the queue. And four dozen roses and a bag of pears. Ooh, and one of those clouds, please, he said. Abacus towed up his bill while Lottie passed him a kind of candy cloud flowing out on the street. Sir, Abacus said, looking up from his words, that comes to her 980 sovereigns. A bargain at twice the price, the old man cried. Noodle's jaw dropped and man pressed ten notes from her hand. Well, thank you, sir, she said. Now, how do you want your change? Spendable or edible? Oh, edible, please, the man said. And immediately, the till dispensed some chocolate. He walked off with a spray in his step. Yula turned to Abacus, a huge grin on her face. Abacus, she said, that customer just gave us a thousand sovereigns. I know, Noodle. Isn't it fantastic? Abacus said. Now, who's next? But the old man got as far as the door when something made him screech to a halt. Er, uh, Mr. Wonka, he said. Willie swiveled on his heel. Yes, sir. The old man pulled off his hat and vivid purple hair spilled out. My head feels funny, he said. Willie frowned. You little gas. Not only was the man's hair purple, but each strand was multiplying at an alarming rate. Is my hair growing? It feels like it's growing, the old man said. Have you always had purple hair, Willie asked. The old man's eyes doubled inside. What? He cried, no. Willie began panic, a mild panic now sizzling in his stomach. It's not possible, he said, but then he stopped and looked down. Unless, he said, he bent down and picked the flyer. Carefully, he gave it the smallest of looks, and his heart said, uh-oh. He said, yeti sweat. 
Yeti sweat the old man cried, his hands moving to his new beard, which was growing so fast he had it had hardly reached the floor and was headed for the outset. The most powerful hair portion in the world, Willie explained. Absolutely wonderful in the right conditions, but I didn't put it in here. He turned to the room. Ladies and gentlemen, there seems to be an error in the recipe. Please, nobody eat the flour. Several, several customers looked up from the flour. But as their faces smeared with chocolate, multicolored hair immediately started sprouting from their head. A man with luminous green hair popped up from the long grass. But the pears are all right to eat up very soon. Not the pears, too, Willie crowed. What's the matter with this licorice? A woman more. My daughter had one bite, and just look at her. Willie watched as the child's mustache came and curled into ringlets. I like it, her daughter said, holding each end of her new mustache defensively. I suit it. Willie raised his hand to the air. Con the I'm terribly sorry, everyone. I don't know how this could happen, but I regret to inform you that the chocolates have been poisoned. Poisoned? A pink-haired customer squeaked. He poisoned my child. I want my money back. Abacus started reluctantly handing the money back. I want compensation. I want revenge. Someone hurled a chocolate pear at Willie and just missing him. It hit the wall and smashed into a thousand pieces. Willie stared down at it sadly. The pear set the others off, and soon everyone was going wild, jeering and flying under the roof in a hairy rage. Chocolate was being watched in every direction, and the woman with the mustache child was cutting through the rope that held the chair to the leer. Arr! she cried with a fury, and the last threads of rope snapped, sending the chocolate crushed to the ground. Willie watched in horror as the whole thing burst into flames. Fire in the gallery's gourmet, a customer word. Willie and the workers stood choking in the smoke as everyone else raced for the exit. High up in their office above the arcade, Slugworth proud of the fickle grover, stood in their office smirking with delight as they watched Willie's dream burn. <clears throat> Chapter 17 Poison when the fire had finally been extinguished and the firefighters had passed out, Willie stood in the charge remained, clutching his mother's chocolate bar. The impressive chocolate tree had melted into a dripping blob, its delicious shine replaced with black blistering sores. The grass and flowers had been churned up in scorch, and the charred claws were trampled into the floor. The bar's boat had been smashed into pieces, too, and Willie watched as each little bit of it sank down to the chocolatey depths. I don't understand why he whispered. What? What? What happened, Abacus pinched for it. Isn't it obvious? Piper said, her eyes flashing with fury. The chocolate cartel. It's awful, Larry said. I haven't been this sad since. Oh, I'm a cloud. I'm sad all the time. Never mind. Willie put a hand on Willie's. Excuse me. Noodle put a hand on Willie's shoulder. It's okay, Willie. We can rebuild. Let's start again. There's no point, Lilo, he interrupted. It didn't work. It did if the chocolate cartel had not meddled it. No, not that. His eyes filled over tears. The words of his mother echoed in his mind. And when you do share your chocolate with the world, I'll be right there beside you. She promised she would be here, and she wasn't. Your mother said, Noodle said Sally, with a voice so small it was almost a whisper. You didn't really think, she trailed off. I did think she would be here, Noodle, Willie said. I really did. But it was just a stupid dream. Don't say that, Nilo said surly. You told me not to give him up my dreams. You cannot kick him up in your fury. You're Willy Wonka. You make impossible things happen. You can't. Don't ever. Come on, everyone, Abigail said, gently leading Nilo away. I think Mr. Wonka needs a moment to himself. So Willie stood alone, knee deep in his broken dreams, watching the last of the barge disappear into the bubbling river. A single tear rolled down his cheek. Terrible change when it happened to the King of Woods. Willie turned to see Slugworth marching in triumphantly, trying behind him with the other two. I take it you're responsible, Willie said. He felt as if Slugworth had sucked all the hope from him, and he was back for the last dreads, like someone savoring the very last drop of a milkshake. Us? Slugworth fine? No, well, not personally. We may have encouraged Mrs. Scrubbit to borrow some of your ingredients and enhance your creation. We paid for the poison and with some of your little poison bottles, Kronos clarified. So why have you come, Willie well, said, to gloat? Slugworth grinned. Oh no, Mr. Wonka. I don't waste my time with that sort of thing. We came to offer you a deal. 
Vicar Rumor knelt down to open his suitcase and he did so. Willie spread three numbers pencil on the sole of his shoe. He handed Willie a wad of banknotes. This is the precise amount you owe Mrs. Scrubber, he said, reaching back into his suitcase and producing more bundles of money. This is for the number crunched of the plumber and the mousy one, the so called funny man. But which, by which he means not funny, Prano said. And the girl figure grew with Clinton at Prano's impatiently before handing Willie a bit of bundle and all the others combined. We put in a bit extra for her so he so she can get a place to live, clothes, clothes toys, butts. The mention of butts made Willie look up. You remember the first time he met her, the sound of the butts snapping shut. You will love butts. You should change your life, Mr. Wonka's Slugger said even closer. Change all their lives. The thought that he still might be able to help his friends was enough to brighten the spirits a little. What would I have to do, he asked. Leave town, Slugger said bluntly. And never made chocolate again. There's a there's a boat sailing at midnight, and for the sake of your friends and you, I hope you're on board. Willie stared down at the money, and he knew he didn't have much of a choice. He would never have his dream or ever see his friends again, but they would be free, and Noodle, poor Noodle, would finally be happy. Chapter 18, A One-Way Ticket. So this is third. A lot of these chapters that we get closer to the later in this book, they are very, a lot of these chapters are very, very short. So, chapter 18, a one-way ticket. When Willie arrived at the dots, the chief and the chocolate cartel were there waiting for him. Your ticket, Mr. Wonka, Slugger said with oily charm, brandishing a small hammer and ticket, one way to the North Pole. It's pretty much economy, Flicko Groover said. It's basically the same as economy, Prime was clarified, but you get a bit more leg room with a fun sized packet of nuts. The ship's horn sounded in back in the city square. The clock chimed midnight. Now I have to stay in now I'd love to stay in chat for er TikTok. Slugger said impatiently, tapping his watch. Willie noticed that it had stopped at the wrong time again. Goodbye, Mr. Wonka, Slugger said he grabbed Willie's hand with a final bone crushing handshake. Willie wants his pain as the man's ring cut into his flesh. Goodbye, Mr. Slugger. Willie managed. He bowed his head in defeat and won the game point. On board, he handed his ticket to the waiting captain, who gave the chief a sly nod, though Willie was too consumed with sadness to notice. Within seconds of him boarding the ship, the ship roared to life and was chugging out of the harbor toward the ocean. Willie didn't dare glance back. He couldn't. Instead he, sounded, he, instead, he made his way to the front of the ship, where he found a wooden bench with a sign, Premium Economy, lazily scrawled on it. He settled into the seat and wrapped his plum coke around, around it. The sky was sleet and gray, and the snow was falling thick and fast now. Then came a sound, faint clunk, clunk, and scraping of wheels. Willie turned and was delighted to see the Oompa Loompa lugging a tiny travel trunk behind him. He stopped at Willie's feet and opened it, revealing a minuscule paddled sea and mini bar. He passed it, he plucked an olive from a jar and held it up for Willie. Olive, I'm so glad you're here, Willie said, his voice cracking a little bit at the sight of a familiar face. Really, I am. Well, I'm not going to let you out of my sight, Willie Wonka, the Oompa Loompa said. Not until you paid your debt. By being glad tidings on that score, I've been doing my son. One more jar and we'll be even. Or, per, I'll accept half a jar of those rather Amusing hover chucks. While well, you're out of chuck, excuse me, while well, you're out of luck, Willie said, staring at the vast ocean head. I don't make chocolate anymore. You don't mean you're going through with this ridiculous deal, the Uncle Lumpus says. I have to. For Noodle, Willie said, I promised her a better life. I pinky promised. You should stand up to those bullies, the Uncle Lumpus said. Give them the old one, too. That's what an Uncle Lumpa would do. But if you're determined to sit there feeling sorry for yourself, I'm going flat. Good night, sir. Then he pressed the button, and his chair started whirring and began to recline. He re released his finger on the button when it was completely flat, and then pulled on an eye mask. Willie shuffled uncomfortably in his hard seat. His hand still ached from Slugger's handshake, but it was really throbbing. He held it up to take a better look. Huh, he said. The opal line pressed the button on the chair, and he whirred it back to his seat in position. He looked at his eye mask. What is it, he asked. 
No, it's nothing, Billy said. It's not nothing, is it? The Oompa Loompa pressed. You said, oh. Willie shook his head. His eyes still fixed on his hand. Sorry, forget it. The Oompa Loompa lowered his eye mask again. Huh, Willie said again. The Oompa Loompa threw his, off his eye mask this time. You did it again. If you thought I split, I shall poke you viciously with a contact stick. Look where Slugworth shook my hand, Willie said, all the way out for the Oompa Loompa to see. A red pattern was stamped on his skin. His lame up to March. See, an A surrounded by an S. Very ordinary. The Oompa Loompa plucked a monocle from his pocket and held it up to take a good look. So, his name is Arthur Slugworth, he concluded. It's probably a family ring. But Noodle has one that looks just like it, Willie said. Noodle, the Oompa Loompa said, and Willie nodded. But why would the little orphan girl have a Slugworth family ring? The only, one, only one reason I could think of, Willie said. Well, what is it, the Oompa Loompa asked. If I'm right, Willie said, slowly rising to his feet and staring off into the distance. That she could be in great danger. He began looking around plainly. I gotta get back to land. Captain! Willie shut off and searched the cabin. We have to turn the ship around. He cried, Captain, where are you? The ship, we need to turn around. Come back here, the Oompa Loompa shouted as he hurried after him. I demanded an explanation. What is your theory about the ring? But Willie wasn't listening. He tore across the ship, bridge and cane, surged into a hall of the wheelhouse. When he saw he what was inside, a tingling of utter horror danced up his spine. There was no captain, but even worse than that, sitting in the captain's place was blizzard, furious, but on second thought, the explanation can wait. The Oompa Loompa said, and he inflated a tiny life jacket. I do hope you can swim, Willy Wonka. The chief of police stood with the three chocolatiers as they watched the ship skim the horizon. Slugworth's lips mind was countdown. Five, four, three, two, boom. And with that, every inch of the ship was herded off in all directions, until the only thing left was a plum of smoke snaking up into the sky. Well, gentlemen, the chief said, one dead chocolatier as requested. Slugworth raised his watch to tell you, Miss Bonbon, give the chief his chocolate. Miss Bonbon was not far behind the man a crane. She grabbed the control and began lowering an enormous crate of chocolate down in front of the chief. The chains clanged and the crane groaned as it swung dramatically in the wind above them. Miss Bonbon was sticking out her tongue in concentration as she poked at the buttons. Then all of a sudden, she swung the whole thing too far to the left. The chain pinned and snapped, and the chocolate landed on the chief's car with an almighty crunch. There was a groan of metal at the roof, sad, and then all four of the wheels popped up. And look, Miss Bonbon's loaded it into your car for you as well, Slugworth said, as they all watched the wheels roll away. The chief didn't seem to care, because all he, because all he could see now was chocolate. Chapter 19. Settling the Bill My, my, what a lot of long faces we have this morning, Mrs. Scrubber took cheerfully as she greeted the workers. They filled past They followed past her to the washout, but she put a leg out to stop them. I've got some good news for you, she teased. Not that you deserve it. She placed a bundle of cash in the register and stamped Abacus Bill. Your friend Willy Wonka has done a deal with Mr. Slugger, gave up his precious little dream. To settle your accounts, he said. So, Mr. Crunch, I believe you are free to go. Abacus took Goffin out the ink pad pain mark on the paper, completely frozen in shock. Mr. Crunch, Mrs. Scrubbit said, you're free to go. Go on, Bleacher Word, scram. Before I charge you for dialing, Mrs. Scrubbit said with a waggle of her finger. Abacus took the receipt, flashed his fellow workers with a light smile, and then shot off. An excited murmur rippled through the group, but you will fix the horrible woman with a stony stare. And after a lifetime being thrown in the coop, the generosity was suspicious. Bell, Ben, Chuckworth, Mrs. Scrubber, groaned as she ushered them out. Only Noodle was left. She stood there small and alone. The reality of just how alone she was began to sink in. Ah, uh, Noodle, Mrs. Scrubber said, the biggest pile of the lot. And much to Noodle's surprise, she plunked at a huge, heavy weight of cash down on the counter with, with a bang. Noodle's eyes grew wide, wider than they had ever grown before. She hadn't believed it was possible until that second. But there it was, her debt, and it was repaid. It was sitting right there, freedom and happiness and escape from the coop. Finally, she would be free. She could go, find, she could go and find Willie and the others. Noodle reached out to touch it. 
Except this pile isn't to pay your bill, dearie. Mrs. Scrubber said, snatching the well, but wait, Mitt, you'll stare at them. Wait, it's to keep you here. Mrs. Scrubbit screeched with glee, and that's where you to laugh hysterically. She pounded the counter over and over again. Then she started dancing from foot to foot. You thought you were leaving, huh? Noodle stood frozen and shocked as Boots were bolted the door. My friend Mr. Slugworth doesn't think nasty little urchins like you should be out on the street. Not in a fine city like this, Mrs. Scrubbit cackled. We gave him this morning to keep you down in the wash house for good. She stopped laughing, and her face suddenly grew very serious, and I'm only too happy to oblige. I hate you, Newell screamed, charging for the window, but Bleacher grabbed her by the scarf of her neck and lifted her in the air. Look at her go, my lord, with Scrubbit, Mrs. Scrubbit said with a cruel smile. My lord, Newell says we have to laugh. You don't still think he's relative, do you? Mrs. Scrubbit looked confused. We made it all up, Mrs. Scrubbit, Newell. She had you warm, guzzling fool. He's not Bavarian royalty. He's not royalty at all. At that, at that, Mrs. Scrubbit's face twisted in horror. First she went as gray as her warm wire. Then she looked as if she might faint. Then finally she turned a furious shade of purple. Her bays popped in her head and her nostrils flared. Right, that's it. She spat with more fury than Doodle had ever seen before. You're going in the coop, my girl. She grabbed Nudo by the ear and dragged her out past Bleacher, who had momentarily forgotten he actually wasn't a German aristocrat and was completely floored by such a revelation. I take the duggeries out, Mrs. Scrub and stabbed him, tears in her you you pet puppy one Bleacher tried, but it was no good. Mrs. Scrub had dragged Nudo up the stairs and threw him in the coop, slamming the door so hard the pigeons panicked. Feathers with flying claws snagged in Nudo's hair, and she screamed as the last of the birds fought their way. Out of the pigeonhole, she was alone once more. A single tear rolled down her cheek as she stared blankly ahead, wishing more than anything she hadn't dared to dream things. Mike, you better. Ah, there she is, came a jarly, cheerful voice. Hello, Noodle. She turned and there was Willie, his face smushed through one of the pigeonholes. She peeked out and saw he was balancing on a rickety ladder. Noodle shook her head, convinced she was dreaming. Uh, I thought you left, she said quietly. I thought you'd all left me forever. I did, Willie explained. I made a deal with the cartel. Slugworth promised you a better life if I left forever. But he didn't exactly keep to his side of the bargain. No, Noodle said her knee knees nestled in thick muck. He did, in fact, the opposite. He wants me locked up forever, apparently. Of course he does, Willie mused as he produced a metal file and began cutting the paddle. Why, Noodle asked. What's he got against me? I've never even met him. I don't know, Noodle, not for sure, but I think it might have something to do with your parents. My parents, Noodle whispered. It's just a theory, Willie said. All I know for certain is you won't be safe until he's behind bars. Abacus face appeared in another of the pigeons, home, making Noodle jump. Yes, and how exactly is that supposed to happen, Mr. Wonka? He asked. You said the cartel keeps a record of their dirty deeds, Willie said, still going at the padlet. Abacus not in the green ledger yet. So if we could get, get a hold of that, we can prove they poisoned the chocolate. Scrubber and Bleacher would go to jail and we'd all be free, said Willie. It sounds good to me, Piper, said her face appearing in the pigeonhole next to Willie. You're all here, asked Noodle with a huge grin. Yes, of course, Noodle. We wouldn't leave you, Abigail said. Now, Mr. Wonka, may I remind you that they keep the ledger in a vault? Lottie's face appeared in the pigeonhole next to Abigail's, guarded by a corrupt cleric, she said, flashing Noodle a smile. And 500 chocolate months, Larry said, appearing next to Lottie. That's very true, Willie mused. But I just had a long, cold swim. Cold light is very good for the brain. Simulates the neural pathways. And after just four hours, I figured out how an ingenious orphan, ingenious orphan, a plumber, a telephone exchange operator, an account, and a man who could talk to the right could buy their skill to pull up a miracle. Abacus said, It would be its. Mr. Wonka, Abacus said, It would be exceedingly complicated. Have you forgotten there's a code to get into the vault? Yes, a nine digit code changes daily, Willie mumbled. His attention fits on the padlock. He began hitting. I think I know where to find that code, he said. Really? Piper said. Spit it out there. Well, Willie said, taking a break from whacking the padlock and glancing around to check no one could hear. He lowered his voice to a whisper. When Prognos' wig falls off at Gallery's Go May, I noticed three no numbers written on the inside. I don't think anything of it at that time. But then last night, when Philco Grove tried to bribe me, I saw he had three numbers written on the sole of his shoe. I bet anything, that's where they keep their parts of the code. 
he might be on to something, Piper said. That silly slugworth, Mila pointed out. You're not telling me he does enough to write down anything. I didn't point out because it's, he hasn't really said. I noticed his watch. He's broken the day I got it. I thought it was a strain for a rich man to wear a broken watch. It was still broken last night, but they told a different time. Why would you change the time on a broken watch? Lottie said slowly. Mila's eyes grew white because that's where he keeps his part of the code. Exactly, Mila. Willie, Willie said as the padlock finally snapped and the code spread out. There's just one problem, Abacus said. Even if you do get your hands on the ledger, the cartel will simply buy their way out of trouble. It's the way of the world, Noodle said with a sigh. You're right, Noodle, Willie said. I hate to admit it, but you you are. That's why there's only one thing to do. What's that? Noodle asked. Willie flashed. Willie's eyes flashed with mischief. Change the world. All right, so that was chapters 13 through 19. And we are almost at the end. And we will continue reading Wonka tomorrow. Thanks for watching.